You will hear a number of different recordings and you'll have to answer questions on what you hear. There'll be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you'll have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you'll be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You'll hear a head teacher and a teacher discussing a school camping trip. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. You'll see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning, Mr. Thompson. Can I speak to you for a moment? Of course, Jamie. Come in. Have a seat. I've just finished looking through the reports for this term. It looks like the pupils are doing very well. Mr. Thompson says he's just finished looking through the reports, so B has been circled. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning, Mr. Thompson. Can I speak to you for a moment? Of course, Jamie. Come in. Have a seat. I've just finished looking through the reports for this term. It looks like the pupils are doing very well. Yes, I think they are. It's all going fine. So, Jamie, what's on your mind? Well, I've been thinking about next month's camping trip, the one for year 10. Yes, we've got it scheduled for the 23rd to the 26th, if I'm not mistaken. Ah, uh, actually, I think it's the 24th to the 27th. Let's just check. Oh, right. Yes, yes, you're right. So... Well, I've been thinking about how we might possibly make this year's event even better than last year's. Not that last year's wasn't great, but... Suggestions for improvement are always welcome, Jamie. So, what have you been thinking about? Well, to tell the truth, I wasn't completely happy with the camp we used last year. It was rather small, and I didn't feel that the grounds were particularly well kept. Go on. I did some searching, and I think I found the perfect spot. It's called Shepton Meadows, and... Is that the campsite in the Lake District? No. Actually, it's just outside Carlisle. It's a huge site, and it's on a lovely lake, Lake Brant, I believe it's called. Half the site is forested, and the rest, the actual camping area, is grassy. For kids that rarely get to see anything more than concrete, it's ideal. And the facilities are amazing. There's a basketball court, a large pool, and a football pitch. There are well-marked trails through the forest for hiking, and the lake is there for swimming and other water sports. I believe there's even a lifeguard service. That sounds like it might suit our purposes perfectly. Did you happen to find out about availability and cost? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. I called them yesterday evening, and there are plenty of spots available. And because we're a non-profit organisation, they said they would give me a reduction in the price. If I remember correctly, we paid £5 a head last year. Yes, per night, right? Yes, each child paid £10 for the two nights. Well, at this campsite, it's only £4 per night. And they told me that if we had over 50 children, which we do, they could give us a further 10% off. That's very reasonable, isn't it? Well, from what you've told me, I think we should probably go ahead and book. Excellent. I'm sure the children will love it. I'm sure they will. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10.
Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, Jamie, have you given any thought to an itinerary by any chance? As a matter of fact, I have. Wait one second. Yes, here it is. I've made a few notes. OK, so, now, these are just ideas, of course. Yes, yes, go on. Let's hear what you've got. Right. We time it so that we arrive at the camp around 7 on Friday evening. It'll still be light then, and we'll have plenty of time to set up camp and get ourselves settled in. At 8, we could have a barbecue, you know, hamburgers and hot dogs, something that's nice and easy to prepare. And that children love. Yes. Then, lights out would be at 9.30, so the children will get a good night's sleep and be up bright and early at 7 on Saturday morning. Breakfast would be at 7.30, an hour's hiking from 8 till 9, and then a couple of hours at the lake. That would take us up to 11. I think that an hour of free time would then be in order. Let them have a chance to explore a bit on their own, you know? Yes, great idea. And then? Let's see, a picnic lunch at 12, and then sports in the afternoon till 4. Another swim until 5, and then supper. After clean-up, around 6.30, we could have a talk-back session, where the children get a chance to discuss their day and anything else they might have on their minds. Then a campfire and sing-along at 8, back to the tents at 9.30, and, well, that takes care of Saturday. Excellent. Excellent. That would certainly keep them busy. What about Sunday? Sunday, right. As on Saturday, same wake-up and breakfast times, and then I thought we could go on a bit of a day trip. There are some caves about an hour's walk from the camp, which I thought the children might find interesting. We could leave at eight, which would mean we'd get to the caves at nine. They could explore for a couple of hours, and we'd head back at eleven. Twelve o'clock would see us back at the meadows. An hour's swim, and then lunch at one. Then we could have organized games in the afternoon until supper at five. It would take us an hour to clean up our sights and pack up. We'd be on the buses at six and all set to head back into the city. Well now, you've certainly put a lot of thought into this, Jamie, and it's paid off. I think it sounds wonderful. I can't think of a thing that needs to be changed. Let's go for it. Brilliant. I'll get the itinerary printed up and put it up on the notice board this afternoon. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear a Director of Student Administration from Mitchford University giving a talk on Open Day. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hello to you all. Thank you for coming to Mitchford University's Open Day. My name is Jackie Alford and I'm the Director of Student Administration. I must begin by passing on some late-breaking news. For the second year running, Mitchford University has been the winner of the prestigious Distance Education Award. As an online university, we are thrilled with this and thank our excellent staff for their dedicated work. We now add this trophy to our Research Excellence Award. The only one remaining is the best overall university, which we are expecting to be announced in the near future. Now, I want to cover a few aspects of what we offer our students from the student administration point of view. I would like to cover a few of the core things we deal with here at the university. Our office is always busy. Firstly, we handle all requests for on and off campus housing. First year bachelor's degree students, we offer any and all assistance. If you're considering a postgraduate degree with us, which some of you uh, coming to the area with families are, I've met some of you already, I think, 
Please be aware that due to staff constraints, we are only able to help international students. My department is also responsible for the collection of all student fees and, aside from exam week, we often assist with timetabling. Our department is in close contact with enrollment so we know all your examination results. Student fees are used to help with the extracurricular activities here on campus. Each semester we put on a movie night and last year we tried a music appreciation night which was well received. We often invite a number of local charities in the area to participate in our movie nights. This has been a good way for us to give back to some of the local people. Now when you apply for a place at Mitchford University, your application package goes first to the registrar's office where it is either accepted or rejected based upon your past academic record and test results. If you are accepted, it comes to the Student Administration Department where we examine any special requests you may have included in your application. After that, a letter is sent to you informing you of your acceptance. The whole process takes about three to four weeks. Generally, if we receive applications by April or early May, students are notified of their acceptance in late June unless you make mistakes with your application, which is all too common. Before listening to the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 18 to 20. Yes, there are things we ask you not to do. Some people forget important information, believe it or not, and we get this most often. Some applicants forget to include a forwarding address. We can't send anything back to them. Another big one is forgetting to include past academic records. Hey, please don't forget them. We've had minor problems with people forgetting to include the processing fee, which stands at $45. Still others leave off the compulsory picture of themselves. Oh, yes, and perhaps the most common mistake people make is sending the application to the incorrect address. Please send the application to our post office box address. Okay, that's enough for me. Any questions? That is the end of section 2. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers. Test 4, Section 3. You will hear a student, Alex, asking his tutor for advice about essay writing. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 21 to 27. Hi, Alex. Come in. I gather you wanted some help with writing essays. Yes. I'm finding this first term difficult, and I'm worried about the assignments we have to do for January. Well, let me see if I can help. You shouldn't panic about it, because essay writing is a very straightforward process, really. What it involves is organising the information that you want to include. You shouldn't have more than you can easily manage within the word count. Make sure you haven't got too much or anything irrelevant. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to look at that and work out what you need and what you don't need before you start. 
and then you just have to think about how you're going to put forward your argument. Oh, that sounds very straightforward when you put it like that. <laughs> But I'm worried I haven't got the necessary skills for writing an effective essay because English is my second language. Mm. Well, perhaps you misunderstand the skills you need. You need to be able to analyze your data, and then I would say the skills of interpretation and expressing yourself are important. Perhaps it's this last one that bothers you, but the more essays you write, the more you will develop these skills. Yes, and I don't quite know how to improve at that. Though, as you say, I know practice will help.、Mm. And I need to make sure I've got everything ready before I start. Yes, what is vital to good essay writing is preparation. So make sure you build in enough time to do the research you need. Are there any other sources I can use to help me with essays? Yes, you should go to the library and look through the reference section. Because there are books that focus on the style we use in academic writing, and those will help you a lot. The other thing that you should think about is what happens when you've actually written your essay. Too many students just complete their work and hand it in, whereas what you should be doing is making sure that you edit it as thoroughly as possible. Oh yes, that's a good idea. Then I'd pick up any mistakes and also see if it reads logically. Exactly.、Uh, the other thing is, again, what a lot of students do is get their essays back, look at the marks, then just file it away.、Hmm. <laughs> they don't realize that if they checked it through and looked at what the tutor had written, then they can learn from their old essays. Yeah, I can see that's a good idea. So, is that okay? You can always come back to me. You now have fifteen seconds to read questions twenty-eight to thirty. Actually, there were a couple of other things I wanted to ask you about essay writing. Uh huh. I had had a few thoughts of my own about what I should do, such as really taking good notes when I'm reading, because that helps, doesn't it?、Mm, I think it improves your knowledge rather than your actual writing.、Uh, but one tip I can give you is to try and not read too much. Otherwise, you end up including irrelevant material in your essay. Remember to stay on task. Yes, sometimes I have problems interpreting the questions correctly, or the whole question seems overwhelming to me.、Mm. What I try to do is highlight the key parts and divide it into smaller chunks so I can manage it. Well, you might find it useful to break it down even further by making sure you understand all the words perfectly before you start. Things like assess or comment and such like. Yes, I see. Sometimes, after an objective analysis, the question actually asks you for a subjective opinion, but you must remember to support your arguments if that's the case.、Mm. Um, one final comment I can make is about using your own words. You must try to do this as far as possible. You're expected to summarize what you've read, not just string together a list of quotations. In fact, you shouldn't have too many. Just use them where it's really important. Okay, thanks. Do you read other students' essays when you've finished? No. Why? Is that a good idea? Well, you can confuse each other, so I'd advise against it. But it's up to you. Okay. Thanks very much for your time.
Now turn to section 4 on page 56. Section 4 You will hear a talk about memory in babies and young children. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 35. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 35. We're going to look today at some experiments that have been done on memory in babies and young children. Our memories, it's true to say, work very differently, depending upon whether we are very old, very young or somewhere in the middle. But when exactly do we start to remember things and how much can we recall? One of the first questions that we might ask is, do babies have any kind of episodic memory? Can they remember particular events? Obviously, we can't ask them, so how do we find out? Well, one experiment that's been used has produced some interesting results. It's quite simple and involves a baby in its cot, a colourful mobile and a piece of string. It works like this. If you suspend the mobile above the cot and connect the baby's foot to it with the string, the mobile will move every time the baby kicks. Now you can allow time for the baby to learn what happens and enjoy the activity. Then you remove the mobile for a time and reintroduce it some time from 1 to 14 days later. If you look at this table of results, at the top two rows, you can see that what is observed shows that two-month-old babies can remember the trick for up to two days and three-month-old babies for up to a fortnight. And although babies trained on one mobile will respond only if you use the familiar mobile, if you train them on a variety of colours and designs, they will happily respond to each one in turn. Now, looking at the third row on the table, you will see that when they learn to speak, babies as young as 21 months demonstrate an ability to remember events which happened several weeks earlier. And by the time they are two, some children's memories will stretch back over six months, though their recall will be random with little distinction between key events and trivial ones, and very few of these memories, if any, will survive into later life. So, we can conclude from this that even very tiny babies are capable of grasping and remembering a concept. Look at questions 36 to 40. Now answer questions 36 to 40. So, how is it that young infants can suddenly remember for a considerably longer period of time? Well, one theory accounting for all of this, and this relates to the next question we might ask, is that memory develops with language. Very young children with limited vocabularies are not good at organising their thoughts. Though they may be capable of storing memories, do they have the ability to retrieve them? One expert has suggested an analogy with books on a library shelf. With infants, he says, it's as if early books are hard to find because they were acquired before the cataloguing system was developed. But even older children forget far more quickly than adults do.
In another experiment, several six-year-olds, nine-year-olds and adults were shown a staged incident. In other words, they all watched what they thought was a natural sequence of events. The incident went like this. A lecture, which they were listening to, was suddenly interrupted by something accidentally overturning. In this case, it was a slide projector. To add a third stage, and make the recall more demanding, this accident was then followed by an argument. In a memory test the following day, the adults and the nine-year-olds scored an average 70%, and the six-year-olds did only slightly worse. In a retest five months later, the pattern was very different. The adults' memory recall hadn't changed. But the nine-year-olds had slipped to less than 60% and the six-year-olds could manage little better than 40% recall. In similar experiments with numbers, digit span is shown to vary enormously. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute.